This video is difficult for me to make. Not just because of the real world stuff that's going on as I write the script. No, the reason why I even made this channel was as a form of escapism. What makes this script hard to write is the fact that I can't decide how I feel about Mass Effect 3. Over the approximately 75 hours I have spent with Shepard and the various iterations of the Normandy and its crew, I have formed a bond with them that is unlike any I have formed with any characters in any game prior. That's why it's hard for me to decide if I'm perceiving the resolution of this epic story poorly because of this bond, or if my negativity stems from the plot itself being inherently flawed. This video will not only be a critical analysis of what is one of the most divisive titles in video game history, but it will also be a way for me to, hopefully, figure out where exactly I fall on the spectrum of people who hate or love this game. Although to be fair, I don't think that it's a spectrum at all so much as it is a staunch binary position that one must take. Instead of following the structure of either of the two videos I have made on this series thus far, I'll present my views on the gameplay first and then take you through the plot. Disassembling every significant aspect of it and putting it under the microscope wherever I see fit. So, without further ado, let's start an analysis of Mass Effect 3 with what is, perhaps, its least interesting part, its gameplay. When I say that the gameplay is the least interesting part of Mass Effect 3, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. See, almost every single aspect of the game's story has been a point of contention since its release. But from what I can tell, the gameplay is more or less unanimously praised across the board. This praise isn't undeserved either. Bioware really did all that they could to improve on the gunplay from the past two games, making it more fluid and cohesive than ever before, giving it a unique feel while still retaining the best parts of the games that came prior. First off, you can run infinitely now. This makes traversing environments much faster. Traversal has also been given a greater aspect of verticality. You can climb up ladders, jump across gaps, and vault over smaller objects. The traversal sections, one of which is a fairly long chase, are almost always scripted, but since moving in and out of cover and changing cover has also been made more fluid, the changes to movement do bleed into the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay as well. The issue is that running, taking cover, interacting with ladders, interacting with objects, and vaulting over objects are all mapped to X which makes for some truly aggravating moments. In particular, I can think of three instances where I was trying to interact with an object to complete an objective, or just trying to pick up a heavy weapon, but Shepard would instead hide behind cover, vault over it, or just run around in circles as I tried to avoid fire. In one of the final missions of the game, a seemingly endless amount of enemies were thrown at me as I was directed to interact with something to finish that section. I died so many times, Simply because getting Shepard to the object was a dreadful task, considering how many obstacles there were along the way that just forced him into cover. Even after I got to the thing I was supposed to interact with, Shepard just refused to end my misery and just press a damn button, opting instead to do squats like he was James Wig on leg day. The situation was aggravating and the only remedy was to preemptively stand close to the object in question hiding directly opposite it to make sure I would be in the best possible place to interact with it as soon as the game needed me to. This wouldn't have been so bad were it not for some of the enemy designs in the game. In a cover-based shooter such as this, it makes perfect sense to have enemies that shoot at you rapidly, confining you to your place of respite as you meticulously whittle away at their hilts. But in this game, there are a lot of enemy types like the Harvesters, Geth Rocket Troopers, and the Destroyers who have extremely little downtime between their attacks. These enemies are just annoying to fight, particularly since the enemy AI is improved across the board now and other enemies will rush you, displacing you from your preferred cover, as you're endlessly bombarded by projectiles that have the potential to stun lock you to death. Oh, and don't even get me started on the ridiculously overpowered turrets that Cerberus engineers can lay down multiples of. Speaking of Cerberus, a very large part of the game involves you fighting waves upon waves of Cerberus operatives. This gets exhausting. The game has decent enemy variety, but dispensing enemy types at a steady pace to maintain novelty has been an issue from the inception of the series, and nowhere is this more apparent than Mass Effect 3. What makes Cerberus enemies that bit more annoying to fight is that a lot of them just randomly cause dust clouds to appear, which prevent you from targeting them. 
I get that it is supposed to incentivize aggression, but dear God, does their ability to turn any battle into one fought in a sandstorm frustrating. Let's move away from the enemy types and focus on the gunplay and powers now. There are a variety of guns this time around, in stark contrast to Mass Effect 2 which dropped the loot system. Mass Effect 3 sets up an interesting compromise between the excessive loot of Mass Effect 1 and the shallow variety of Mass Effect 2 by providing players with weapons and armor pieces which can be picked up like loot from the first game but which are as meaningful, if not more, than the weapons Mass Effect 2 equipped Shepard with. To further promote player choice, weapons are no longer class logged. Instead, an equip load system is put into effect, wherein, if you exceed your carry capacity by equipping ship with too many classes of weapons, the recharge speed of your powers decreases, but if you stick to only one or two weapon classes, the recharge speed improves. I love this system. It opens up avenues of player experimentation even more than the remastered version of Mass Effect 1 which allowed you to carry all weapon classes at all times, since now you can decide whether or not you are willing to trade off a shorter recharge time for your powers for more raw firepower. Weapon mods make the system even deeper as they allow you to min-max the weapon to your liking. Don't want to be dragging along a giant sniper rifle? Equip it with ultralight materials. Such choices add to the role-playing aspect of the game greatly something that Mass Effect 2 seemed to be detracting from. There is a glaring oversight though. When you're purchasing a weapon in store, you can't see its attributes in relation to what you have currently equipped, making the decision of purchasing a particular weapon feel like complete guesswork. It's like one of those Amazon mystery boxes. You know how much you spent, but you have to wait till after you spent that amount to see if the investment was worth it. The lack of class-specific weapon benefits does seem odd, though, till you consider the fact that each weapon can be upgraded a total of 5 times at the cost of credits. So, instead of investing skill points to make your weapon proficiency better, you instead have to choose which weapon is worth investing credits into. Not a perfect system, but I personally prefer it to class benefits. The more weapon-oriented classes do also have class benefits which increase weapon damage across the board and increase carry capacity as well. So your starting class does play a role in how good you are with guns. As always, I decided to make my character more biotics oriented. So I simply carried a heavy pistol and a sniper rifle and relied more on my biotic prowess, as well as the abilities of my companions. The power and leveling system has been revamped significantly. Shepard has access to more powers than last time, and each power or class ability has 6 tiers of upgrades. The first three of these are going to be the same for everyone, but the other three are presented as binary choices, each of which offers a different benefit. You can choose the upgrade that better suits your playstyle and party. You can choose to opt for raw damage, a greater recharge speed, or a wider area of effect. It's similar to how the last game made you choose between two alternatives whenever you reach the final tier of upgrades for a specific ability, but here you have to make that choice three times over. This really allows you to mold Shepard how you see fit. Through interactions with team members, you can also unlock some special abilities to equip to Shep that would be otherwise inaccessible. The one that I chose was Energy Drain, which allowed me to sap enemy shields and use them to increase my own. This ability was endlessly useful, particularly towards the end of the game. What made Energy Drain even more fun to use was the fact that I could use it in conjunction with ED's Incinerate ability to set off tech detonations. In the last game, using two complementary biotic powers would lead to special effects, and in this one, this system has been extended to tech powers. It's still hilarious to see enemies fly off into outer space when you combine lift and throw, but allowing engineers to set up tech synergies is undoubtedly a good decision. My main problem with combat in this game is that the developers seem to think that it was much more engaging than it ended up being. Combat encounters are sometimes stretched out for truly egregious amounts of time and they get mind-numbingly boring when you have to fight the same few enemy types over and over as you make your way through a relatively unengaging environment, particularly since there's no puzzles to provide gameplay variety anymore. There's one thing that I haven't mentioned, something that those who have played the previous games or watched literally any videos about them will know all too well. Mini games have been entirely removed. It's a change that makes sense, those games were tedious as all hell to complete over and over again, but I would be lying if I said I didn't miss them. They had a certain charm to them that the turret sections of this game, which are the closest things to many games in this one, just can't match. 
From what I've said about the combat and leveling system, it may seem like RPG mechanics have been improved upon across the board. The truth is that the change is more neutral than the combat improvements may let on, which is ironic because the neutral option in conversations has been eradicated. Not only is there no charm or intimidate skill to push Shep into being a better conversationalist, one of the three options that you usually had in conversations in previous games has been eliminated, making all decisions black or white. This has the opposite effect of what I think was intended, since it makes the Renegade and Paragon options virtually indistinct in a lot of situations, instead of increasing the divide between them. This change is also baffling when examined in conjunction with the vastly improved reputation system. While in previous games, Paragon and Renegade checks were dependent on your past Renegade or Paragon actions, in this one, you instead have a singular reputation bar which fills up as you make decisions in general and interact with NPCs or help them out. This reputation bar is used for reputation checks instead of your relative Paragon and Renegade score, which allows you to change your moral alignment to fit the situation, provided you have enough reputation points to begin with. This is a welcome change since the morality system was always arbitrary to begin with and being forced to make your present decisions dependent on your past choices leaning towards a specific alignment made little sense. Vestiges of the old system are apparent in the Renegade and Paragon interrupts though, and they're even more opaque than they were in the last game. Sometimes I would press L2 to engage with the Paragon QTE hoping that it would make Shepard support a teammate in an argument and he would instead give them a moral lesson that I personally didn't believe in. I don't know who thought it would be a good idea to bring the system over into this game but I would recommend performing all Renegade interrupts since Shepard does some truly outrageous things at times. There's one last thing to discuss before we get into the plot. The galaxy map has been altered drastically. Like in the last game, the Normandy appears as a small model that you can control. Unlike the last game, you don't need to spend ages scanning planets for resources. Planet scanning is still a thing, but now you only need to launch one probe to collect items on certain planets. You do need to scan the entire system by sending out pulses from the Normandy to first discover which planets need to be probed. Since the Reaper invasion is in full swing in this game, sending out pulses slowly alerts the Reapers to your presence. Scan enough times and the Reapers will start to close in on you and you'll need to leave the system to escape them. This makes the galaxy feel more hostile than before and adds to the wartime feel of the game. Or it would if it didn't make the Reapers seem incredibly dumb. If you leave a system and immediately re-enter it, the Reapers will also have to enter the system again before they continue chasing you down. You can exit and immediately re-enter a system multiple times and they won't ever think to just stay there and wait for you. What makes this more viable is the fact that the Reapers, the most formidable foe in the entire universe, will just politely wait for you as you scan planets. Cheating the Reapers in this way is your best bet for getting all the resources in the system too, since the only other way of decreasing heat in any system is to complete a mission. It's a strange gameplay decision. The devs are basically saying go and do other things and then come back if you want everything that you just scanned the system for. It's tedious and it doesn't promote any sort of creative problem solving beyond pressing X multiple times, hoping that the game would place the Normandy close to the resource you're trying to extract. This system could be made more engaging if you could set lures for the Reapers across each cluster to give yourself adequate time to scan each system. But as it's done here, it's just a game of pure luck with a dash of tedium mixed in for good measure. Mass Effect 3 is dark. No, I mean literally. It's aesthetically a much darker game than the first two. It looks like someone turned the contrast all the way up in post, and I honestly prefer the visuals of the second game to the third one. Tonally, though, this aesthetic matches the plot of the game. The galaxy is at war with the Reapers, and the galaxy is losing. You start off on Earth, right as the Reaper invasion of the planet begins. Shepard is now back with the Alliance, since Cerberus is magically evil once again, and we are somehow completely emancipated from them. The decision to separate from Cerberus is Shepard's and not the player's, and while I think that it should have been the other way around, I understand why that wouldn't have worked in the framework of the story. What I don't understand is why Cerberus is treated as just pure evil right from the get-go, while well, the first game showed you how they aren't that bad anymore, actually. You aren't allowed to question why Cerberus is doing what they're doing, or you can, but everyone else will just brush it away and claim that they have always been like this. It isn't till much, much later in the plot till you start to figure out what's going on behind the scenes, 
But till you reach that point, you just have to be okay with an overwhelmingly negative sentiment from everyone towards Cerberus due to their irrevocably evil actions which go unjustified for the majority of the plot. The opening also sets up Caden's distrust of Shepard, which honestly just made me want to renegade QTA him. It was annoying in the last game and it's annoying in this one, but its payoff is actually thematically fitting, so I won't hark on about it just now. Another thing except the deep blacks of the game that is immediately noticeable is just how hench all the men are. Seriously, the galactic war has them all pumping space steroids or something. Everyone looks like a thumb and it's kinda disconcerting. Anyway, you gallop after Anderson till eventually you are evacuated. But Anderson decides to stay on Earth and rally its forces because the game needs a way to make the decision you made regarding the human council way back in the first game redundant. Udina needs to be the councilman for a specific plot beat to play out. The game undermines decisions you made in previous games repeatedly and it gets aggravating after a point. For now though, we are off to Mars with Caden and a new companion, James Vega. I don't like Vega, but it's mostly because I don't like extroverted gym pros. Examining his character as just that, though, I think they achieved what they set out to do, so that's something. On Mars, you find Liara, and her intimidating personality is much less disorientating than it was in the Lair of the Shadow Broker DLC. I can only imagine how confused someone who hasn't played the DLC would be. Anyway, someone on this Martian facility is trying to steal valuable data about a protein device which might be the key to stopping the Reapers. After a terrible chase where the camera refuses to move with the right stick while you're running, we catch the Cerberus spy and it turns out to be an android of some sort. We take the deactivated synthetic aboard the Normandy. Caden gets hurt in the process and we're forced to take him to the Citadel. I believe that this is also where we have a nightmare in which we are following a child who we saw die on Earth. I hate children though, so this had no emotion impact on me. Also, I don't understand why this child had to be shoehorned in to arbitrarily up the stakes. The game is literally about the galaxy being invaded by seemingly unsurmountable foes. The stakes are high as could be. Back on the Reaper's death device, the Citadel has been redesigned yet again. Now you can explore a bunch of really varied locations, from the embassies to the Presidium marketplace, to a nightclub, a hospital and docks that are admitting refugees. Aboard the Citadel, you will frequently hear ambient conversations. Eavesdropping on some of these unlocks certain side quests, which involve retrieving assets from planets and then returning to the Citadel to turn the quests in. Fetch quests are easy to make and this game is chock full of them. There's some other quests too like Kasumi's quest which have you running around the citadel but those are also devoid of any interesting gameplay. Since you are reinstated as a spectre, you can also commission certain projects from a spectre terminal to further add to your war assets. On your first outing on the citadel, you can hire a bunch of crew members for the Normandy who also, big shocker here, add to the war assets. I suppose it's time to talk about the war assets in detail. Technically, these constitute the main gameplay loop, but they tie significantly into the story as well, so I'll talk about them here. In Mass Effect 3, the secondary objective, apart from assembling the Crucible, is to gather war assets to increase the readiness level of the galaxy to fend off the Reaper threat. Shepard is a Wall Street bro now, so he believes in diversifying his assets to maximize profit. Attaining assets generally involves completing either combat-heavy side quests, like one that has you go to Charles Xavier's school of witchcraft and wizardry, or has you creepily listen in on people's conversations on the Citadel and later give them what they want. They don't seem to find it odd that the creepy man who stood around listening to them as they talked to their friends literally went halfway across the universe to get them back a book or something, so we won't dwell on it either. Anyway, accumulating enough war assets plays a role in how the finale plays out and which endings you can unlock. I would complain that it rewards completionists and takes away from meaningful decision making, but its consequences are so massively underwhelming that this argument holds no water. We'll talk more about these consequences later though. Right now, I'm going to give a broad overview of how Mass Effect 3 approaches its plot before delving deeper into the specific plot beats. Essentially, the story involves Shepard fixing every single major conflict in the galaxy while the Crucible gets built in the background. For the Salarians and Krogans, and the Quarians and Geth, the conflicts that need to be resolved have been set up right from the first game. 
who did not have a major conflict set up. Protein devices and reaper threats need to be resolved instead. In this way, we are rallying all the most prolific alien races in a bid to unite the galaxy against imminent doom. Apart from James, there are two other new squad mates who assist us in this task. The first of these is ED. The Normandy's AI, who was unshackled in the second game and gains a corporeal form in this one through the body of the Cerberus spy we had just defeated. The other is Shavik, a protein who just woke up from a really long nap. ED is an excellent character. The plot of Mass Effect 3 challenges our views on synthetics even more than the second one did, and having such a likeable synthetic squad mate who shows a great willingness to learn about her new sentience can make the player more sympathetic towards them. Javik is a DLC character, and he isn't allowed to have as major an impact on the plot as would otherwise be expected from an ancient and extinct alien race. His memories of the primal forms of the currently dominant alien races can be humorous, but he is underutilized as far as confronting the Reapers is concerned, a byproduct of him being added post launch. Returning crew members take the form of everyone's favorite handsome boy, everyone's favorite blue girl, everyone's favorite migrant girl, and everyone's Caden. Apart from James, I love pretty much every single one of the squad mates, and yes, I'm including Caden on the list, but the reason why he makes a cut is vastly different from the source of my appreciation for the rest of the characters. Liara, Garrus, and Tari have had arcs that finally see their logical conclusion after being set up way back in the first game. Not only is it great to have these familiar faces around, going back and realizing just how much they've changed for the better makes interacting with them that bit more enjoyable. Interactions with them are more limited though, since most of the time when you go to talk to them on the Normandy, They'll give you a few lines of dialogue and you won't have a choice in how to respond to them. Still, I appreciate that you can have many dates with these guys on the Citadel as well. This is going to sound weird because they're literally just lines of code with associated 3D models, but it feels good to be able to tell them just how much I care for them. Back to Caden though. The reason why I enjoyed having him on the squad this time was because I decided to romance him. He was very forthcoming about how he desperately needed something to come back to after the war. Not the best reason to seek out love, but we'll let it slide because Mans actually cooks for you and has some fairly sweet dialogue if you decide to become his betrothed. This did mean that I accidentally logged myself out of a relationship with Diara, but oh well, at least I got me a good snack. Squadmates who don't make a reappearance as part of the main cast do have some fairly prominent roles. We'll talk about Modern and Legion when we get to that part of the discussion of the main plot, but I want to focus on Miranda's plotline for just a second. How poorly it is handled, to be exact. You can FaceTime Miranda a couple of times on the Citadel, and she tells you that there's something going on with her sister. She does this three times. And it seems like this is setting up some sort of side quest that will be shrouded in mystery. But no, it just turns out that her father is working with the elusive man on evil experiments, and you need to take him out through the course of the main plot. Why Miranda wouldn't tell Shepard this, I don't know. Her secrecy regarding the whole affair is extremely strange, but letting her kill her father in an act of vengeance did feel good. Back to the main plot, as I mentioned, we are trying to resolve some major galactic conflicts. The issue is that the Turians and the Asari don't have any ongoing interracial conflict. This means that we just have to help them directly deal with the Reapers. First, we head to a moon of the Turians' homeworld to retard some Reapers that are ravaging through Turian forces. The funny thing is, apart from the indoctrinated enemies, all the Reapers look more or less the same. The game hasn't retconned the fact that Reapers train the essence of their enemies to reproduce. It just doesn't seem to care enough about it to make them all visually distinct. We end up saving a Turian Primarch, but we can't do much against the Reapers. The next set of missions involves the Krogan Genophage, but I didn't attempt that first. No, I made the mistake of delving into the DLC before doing the main missions. I say that this was a mistake because I was greatly unprepared for the extended combat sequences the Omega DLC throws you into. The premise of the Omega DLC is quite appealing. Arya Talok, having been displaced from Omega, plans a coup to take it back. You actually get to play with Arya as well as Nyrene, the first prominent female Turian in this entire franchise. The DLC is quite combat heavy, but helping Arya get back on her throne as the iron-fisted ruler of the criminal paradise felt like a monumental achievement. You can also end up making her more soft-hearted through your dialogue choices, but I like Arya how she is, irrevocably evil. The other DLC takes a page or two out of Lovecraft's books. The Leviathan DLC is Eleanor Light. 
It sees you undertake a galaxy-wide investigation into the death of a scientist and a new method of indoctrination. You would expect mind control to be a rarity, but just about everyone from the Rachni to the Reapers and even some enhanced humans can engage in it, apparently. Anyway, your investigation leads you to an alien race that predates the Reapers, one that was involved in their creation. It's all fascinating stuff, with the only issue being that this race is also restricted to being a war asset. Since all this content was added post-launch, it couldn't have had as massive of an impact on Mass Effect 3's plot as it should have. It ends up being underwhelming and honestly kind of disappointing because of this. After all of that travel, we finally make our way to the Salarian home planet to rescue a Krogan female who has been extensively experimented on. This experimentation wasn't inconsequential since it led to the synthesis of a cure for the genophage. Now, it's time to go to Tichanka to disperse this cure. You get to decide whether or not to actually disperse it. You can also simply lie to the Krogans, and the Salarian councilwoman tells you that you will have her support if you do this. The game does something really intelligent here. Instead of just portraying the Krogans as forces of violence, it has you go through some old Krogan monuments that have been lost to time. This makes the Krogan seem more like an actual people with an actual history than ever before, and it's sure to have an impact on your decision. As if that wasn't enough, Morden has seen the errors of his ways, to the point that he's willing to sacrifice himself to disperse the cure. The only way to stop him from doing this, in fact, is to shoot him dead. Even as he faces death, he sings his lines from the Salarian musical. He'll forever be my favorite squad mate, no questions asked. Having resolved the Salarian Krogan conflict, we make our way to the Citadel, only to find that Odina has staged a coup with the assistance of Cerberus and is about to kill the Council if we don't make our way to them post haste. There are so many things wrong with this plot beat. Even if you read all the notes detailing how he managed to assemble the Cerberus forces in the first place, his motivation is confusing at best and downright moronic at worst. What does he even intend to do after killing the Council? Who will accept him as the sole ruler anyway? The only possible explanation I can think of is something that ties to the game's ending, but it doesn't make sense chronologically, at least from what I can tell. We'll come back to this because there's an other baffling plot decision made here. This game introduces Kai Leng, who seems to be an indestructible force of cybernetics hailing from the land of bland personalities that Caden once found himself in. This character is not built on at all. He's meant to be threatening, but he just adds to the weirdness that surrounds Cerberus. He kills Sane, though, so we do have a reason to seek him out and take revenge for everyone's favorite emo frogman. The next story arc involves the next major interracial conflict. The Quarians decided that the destruction of the universe was the best time to try and take their home planet back from the Geth. The Geth responded to this by aligning themselves with the Reapers to launch a suitable counterattack. This whole situation just makes the Quarians seem like they have a lower IQ than an Elcor has EQ. It seems like this plan was devised and executed by only one of the Quarian ambassadors. How messed up did their political structure have to be to allow for this? Get over these contrivances and your first order of business is to detach Legion to weaken and destroy a massive Geth fighter ship. Then, you just need to make your way to the Quarian home planet to eliminate the Reaper signal that's making the Geth stronger. There is an interim mission here that involves going into the Geth's collective to get rid of Reaper corruption, and it's a visual treat. It also disposes some pretty important exposition about the time the Geth turned on the Quarians, and how Geth sympathizers were treated as mercilessly as the Geth themselves. After this, you can make your way to the Geth's base to destroy the signal. You can also choose to either get all the Geth killed, or you can urge them to coexist with the Quarians. Loyalty missions and past decisions play an important role here. If you don't meet certain requirements, the Geth may just kill off all the Quarians, and Tari will choose to end her life along with them. If you manage to get the Geth to agree, though, Legion dies. There's literally no reason for this to happen. The in-game explanation is that Legion had to sacrifice itself to grant the rest of the Geth's personality so they don't end up like Jacob, but this does not hold up under any scrutiny. Legion already had personality traits, that's why it wore Shepard's armor to begin with. This death feels like they were just trying to meet a minimum criteria of emotional damage inflicted on the player. With that though, it's time to help the Asari and have them help you in return. One of the components of the Crucible is the Catalyst, and the Asari Councilwoman intimates you with the location of the Catalyst, and it's on Thesia, the Asari home planet. 
The funny thing about the plot is that you have very little involvement in the construction of the crucible. In fact, you're only involved in getting the process started and adding the last element. It's just being built in the background as you try to make frenemies with the rest of the universe. The war assets do augment it, but you do not see these improvements being added directly either. But now, it's time to go to Thessia and obtain the catalyst. Turns out, there were Prothean ruins on Thessia, which contributed to the development of the Asari and were seemingly Area 57 by the Asari government. Right as you're trying to figure out what the deal with the Prothean VI and the ruins is, Kai Ling turns up to pull a David Blaine. You talk to the elusive man here and he tells you why Cerberus has been doing all this evil shit. Turns out, the elusive man isn't satisfied just destroying the Reapers. No. He wants to indoctrinate them to make humanity more powerful than ever. The elusive man is trying to pull a quick one on the reapers, but it's very evident that he has himself been indoctrinated by them. They're giving him the sarin treatment, slowly making him more machine than man, increasing their hold over him in the process. I don't love what they've done with Cerberus here. The entire time you're wondering why Cerberus is plain deplorable all of a sudden, and now it turns out that they're being mobilized by the Reapers and the endless greed of the elusive man. I can't think of a single way to improve this plot. Any ideas that I might have would require complete rewrites of the script from start to finish. Something that you're probably thinking about this video too, I'm sure. Anyway, now it's time to track down Cerberus HQ and figure out what the catalyst is. Before that though, I decided to tackle the Citadel DLC. I had heard a lot about this DLC. But even I wasn't prepared for just how much content there is. This DLC feels like two DLCs rolled into one scrumptious concoction, topped with garnishes that fans of the series will devour. It is a complete tonal disconnect from the rest of the story though. It trades the gritty tone of the game for pure camp, and I'm here for it. It would definitely work better as an epilogue, but the ending of the game doesn't exactly leave room for an epilogue, so we'll just have to be happy with what you've got. The first part of the DLC involves tracking down a clone of Shepard from the Lazarus Project, a clone who's trying to take his place. Throughout the entire game, the devs have had to look for ways to split up the party in the most unnatural of ways to prevent you from having support from NPCs who aren't an active part of your squad. Here though, all the squad members along with returning characters like Rex and Samara take part in an extended Scooby-Doo-like chase. You're actively collaborating with all your teammates. And you can see them all in action as they help you, and as you help them. Even disregarding the potential that the existence of Shepard clones has for the future of the series, just the way that you're finally allowed to see everyone in action at once makes this portion of the DLC an absolute delight. The second part of the DLC is what most people remember fondly. Forced to take a short break, you can use Anderson's party grip to throw the party of a lifetime. A celebration of all of the characters that you know and love, plus Jacob. There are so many in-jokes and references here. You can tell that this DLC was made with pure love and admiration for each of these characters. You can also roam around on the strip right outside the apartment complex, interact with squad mates one on one, and even play some mini-games. By the time that the DLC is over though, you're left with the hollowness. Reminded of the fact that the galaxy is on the brink of destruction as you live it up in daddy's high-end apartment. I wish there was some way to integrate this DLC as a proper epilogue, but the less said about the ending, the better. But I will be saying a lot about the ending, so stay tuned for that. God, this is an awkward segue. Horizon! It's time to go to Horizon and investigate what Cerberus has been up to. The issue is that we were literally just told about their motivation, and we already know that they've been abducting people. So I think that most of us can put two and two together to figure out that the elusive man was conducting experiments on indoctrination on humans. But the game feels the need to spell this out for you. Miranda and her father are also here, and this is where you get to see her in person as her arc needs an abrupt ending. I feel like this mission could have been cut out entirely and Miranda's side quest be fleshed out to be its own thing independent of the main plot. With the location of Cerberus HQ finally on our galaxy map, we can head there to reacquire the VI and put an end to this war. Fighting through Cerberus HQ is made interesting by some voice notes that give you backstory on the AI that inhabited Edie's new body, as well as on the Lazarus project. Eventually though, we make our way to the elusive man's room, complete with the half and half sun in the background. Here, we engage in an absolutely laborious boss fight with the token minority Raiden. His plot armor is now turned into literal armor, 
He counteracts all damage you inflict on him till you defeat the adds that he summons. It's just grueling, but you get to take revenge for Thane's murder, so that's something. The Prothean VI tells you that the catalyst is the Citadel. So, with this information, you finally assemble the Crucible. Except, the Reapers have transported the Citadel to the Earth's orbit, and you need to untether it to allow for it to be integrated with the Crucible. The plot goes full circle, and it's time to return to Earth for your last stand. The mission starts off with Cortez, the Uber driver who commands the space car you travel around in, dying. Although I suppose Lyft is a more apt reference here anyway. Man dies, you make your way through to the base of operations for humans, and have the option to say your last goodbyes to your team. This is a truly heartwarming section, and it gave me hope for the ending. Misplaced hope for the ending. Continue on and you're forced into one of the toughest and most frustrating combat sections of the game. You need to first defend and then interact with a certain device while the game throws seemingly infinite hordes of the toughest, most spammy enemies it can think of at you. This is where the press X to do basically everything control scheme really screwed me over. Getting Shep to interact with the damn device was near impossible and it didn't help that restarting the checkpoint set Shep diametrically opposite the stupid thing. It doesn't help either that the Reaper has enabled one hit kill mode and is just raining down death beam upon death beam on the battlefield. This section is aggravating to say the least. Deal with all of this and you're separated from the rest of your squad as you're forced to make a painfully slow final stand to get to the tree from Elden Ring. Ludo narrative dissonance aside, the game thinks the best way to make you feel that Shepard is hurt is to force you to move slowly. I hate such sections in games. I get that they're supposed to convey the feeling that your character is impaired and they achieve this purpose, but this specific section goes on for way too long. Even after you're aboard the Citadel, you still move really slowly. The lead up to the ending is truly dull. Intentionally so, but dull nonetheless. Speaking of the Citadel, it's a terrifying sight. Shep finds themselves in a labyrinth of sorts, a part of the Citadel which didn't even exist before. There are bodies strewn about everywhere, and the Keepers are ominously habituated to their presence. Lug along to Anderson, and the final confrontation with the elusive man plays out. This confrontation is dependent on the dialogue choices that you made in your previous interactions with the elusive man. This confrontation is also so ridiculously inconsequential that it's insulting. No matter what you do, the elusive man will die, and Anderson will pass out from his injuries, presumably meeting the same fate. You can also get Anderson shot to death, but the end result will be the same. Anderson will die no matter what you do, and so will the elusive man. The only difference is whether or not he takes his own life. This parallels Saren's death from the first game, but, unlike the first game, where getting Saren to shoot himself had a tangible benefit of allowing you to skip a whole boss fight, here, it has absolutely zero implications, even more so because of the actual ending of the game. It also makes suicide and indoctrination the only two constants across the series, since the elusive man is somehow able to indoctrinate Shepard into shooting Anderson. We already knew that the elusive man had been trying to master indoctrination, so it makes sense that he's able to exert control over Shep. My problem with this is how underused the elusive man's indoctrination ability actually is. It is used only once during the entire plot, right at the end, and the elusive man can't even use it to save himself from being killed by Shep, unless you also subscribe to the theory that he used it to force Odina into compromising the Citadel, but we already know how inconsequential that plot beat was. To me, it feels like they were building up to us being able to convince the elusive man to use indoctrination against the reapers, like he originally intended. Maybe the purpose of the charm and intimidate options in your previous conversations with him was to set up this exact interaction. But this is just wide speculation, and there's no vestige of this scene in the actual ending, so I'm inclined to believe that this wasn't a planned alternative. With that, I suppose it's time to talk about the ending. Dear God, the ending. The more attentive amongst you might have noticed that I failed to mention the role the war assets play in the ending. This is because, unlike Mass Effect 2, where your completion of loyalty missions leading up to the suicide mission had a pervasive and clear effect on nearly every single aspect of the ending, the amount of war assets you recover determine which of the endings you can unlock. Instead of seeing all the forces you manage to gather unite in the galactic war, Instead of getting help from the various alien races you assisted during the battle on Earth, the war assets are simply a number. A number that, if it exceeds a certain threshold, makes more choices available to you. 
and this makes absolutely zero sense. See, upon uniting the Citadel with the Crucible, you unleash the true Catalyst and it's some sort of VI that moderates the Reaper's actions. It takes the form of the child from the start of the game for some godforsaken reason and you have a nice little chat with it as it explains all the possible endings to you. The first ending involves an indiscriminate destruction of all synthetic life in the galaxy. The Reapers go, sure, but so do the Geth, ED and all other synthetics. The second ending allows Shep to interface with the Reapers and control them somehow. The extent of this control is not explained and neither are the implications of fragmenting Shepard's consciousness into potentially thousands of ultra powerful beings. The final ending, the right one, allows you to send out a pulse that magically integrates synthetic and organic beings, making everyone part synthetic and part organic. There's another ending, one that I inadvertently chose during my playthrough, which the game doesn't even reward you the trophy for finishing the game for. This ending has Shepard firmly refuse all of these options, and it results in the death of all life in the galaxy as we know it, but it allows the beings in the next cycle to overcome the reaper threat using the knowledge we have gained. These endings are all, pardon my ancient Greek with an American dialect, bullshit even with their extended versions. I'm willing to take the magical properties of the Crucible at face value, but the issues with the ending transcend the lack of explanation given about the catalyst and the way in which the Crucible functions. No, the biggest problem with the ending is how it seems to miss the point of the series as a whole, of everything that the series was building up to, right from the first game. We have been taught to sympathize with the Geth, acknowledge their existence as sentient beings in their own right from way back in Mass Effect 1. Mass Effect 2 made this an even more prominent theme by putting Legion on the Normandy. And Mass Effect 3 hammered this point home by having you deal with the conflict between the Quarians and the Geth. Not only that, it gave ED a body as well as a drive to understand emotions. The whole series has been telling you that synthetics are just misunderstood, that organics and synthetics can coexist if they just try. And the Catalyst tells you that this is impossible. Its assessment is based on past experience and it's willing to generalize that experience to the cycle despite repeatedly stating that the cycle is unlike any other. God, kids are dumb. Instead of forcing us to merge synthetics and organics and somehow killing Shepard in the process, wouldn't it make more sense to have an ending where Shepard's actions convince the catalyst that synthetics and organics can get along? Actually, forget about all of that. Even if you're willing to take the catalyst at face value, these endings are still inadequate. Gathering war assets unlocks more ending choices at the end. Why? How is being more prepared to deal with the Reapers doing anything except making us, well, more prepared to deal with the Reapers? Throughout the game, we have seen multiple Reapers being killed, and you've played a role in their demise. The Reapers have been established as being fallible, and it's not a stretch of the imagination that all the forces in the universe working together would be able to take them out. An ending where the galaxy takes a last stand against the Reapers and wins based on war assets alone is feasible, and it makes more sense than most of these endings anyway. Sure, we'll suffer heavy casualties, and you can kill Shepard too if you want, since you seem to be so intent on doing it anyway, but this should be an option. I should mention that I don't have a problem with Shep dying, the grittier tone of the game would indicate a sacrifice of epic proportions if the galaxy is to be saved. But I just want to have a good reason for Shepard's death beyond it simply eliciting an emotional reaction from the player. In trying to get the players to feel melancholic about the ending of the franchise, the writers seem to have forgotten to weave a cohesive plot that doesn't crumble to pieces on being even remotely scrutinized. I wish I could say that the endings of Mass Effect 3 made me feel anything but hollow. Like I was cheated out of a moment which should have impacted me greatly given how invested I was in the series by the time I reached the conclusion of the trilogy. Despite its gameplay innovations, the reappearances of beloved characters and compelling DLCs, Mass Effect 3 fails to meet the most fundamental expectation from the climax of one of the most beloved and recognizable franchises in all of gaming history a satisfactory resolution.